Yeah, well, yesterday, yesterday you explained in the interview about what you are doing right here and how you try to create life. And you need this machine. So tell me, explain to me what is happening in this machine. And in, in, in a language I can understand. So in this machine, what we are doing, this is almost like the chemist's equivalent of a, uh, of a baker who's discovering a new cake. Okay? So the way the baker would bake a cake is to take the ingredients, make the dough, put it in the oven, get the right temperature, the dough would raise and so on. What we've got here is each of those black things is like a pump and they're connected to some bottles which have some chemicals in them and each bottle is a different chemical. So you can imagine that each pump basically is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, up to twelve different chemical inputs. So twelve ingredients for my cake. Now when you make a cake, the order of the addition matters. If you put the eggs in the oven with no flour and the flour on top, no cake. So there are lots of ways of combining it. So what we do here is the reagents, the ingredients get mixed here, okay? And then the reactions go on in here, I think. And what happens is we do the reactions and then we use these instruments here. This one weighs the molecule. This one looks at the color in the infrared. So this is like a, a, a kind of optics, but in the heat range. And this one here is like an NMR machine. This uses, a, this is, uses magnetic reson resonance imaging. This is the same technique you use for an MRI to look at your knee or your brain. So what that does is the water in your body has a little magnet associated with it. And when you put the magnet in a radio field, it goes upright and then decays. So it's like a magnet doing this. So, um, so this measures the weight of the molecule, does it become bigger? This measures the color in the infrared, and this measures the magnetism. So, so those are the three aspects of uh, recognizing a molecule. So that's it. So if you have three ways of recognizing if something is new, that's better than just one way. So you could recognize maybe, am I a new person in the laboratory? You could look at my face. You could look at my, my gait. Maybe you could look at the length of my hair three different measures to say are you different or are you new and what we're trying to do here is work out how to make new molecules by changing the order of the inputs it's a bit like throwing playing uh, blackjack throwing the die and doing it in a different order getting some cards waiting getting another set of cards waiting seeing what the actual hand is so do you get excited from from what you see here I think this is probably one of the most exciting experiments we're doing at the moment. Yarek is combining programming, so he's designing the software that will control the cake maker, and then he has to take the data from here, from here, and from here, in here, and make a decision. The cook, when they're baking a cake, they just go look at it and go, oh, does it look like a cake? Does it taste like a cake? Can I give it to other people when they buy it like a cake? Here, we have to, doing molecular science is quite hard. And it's exciting because we are, we are not limited by um, what we know. We are limited by the way we can combine these together. So it's much more open, it's much more, so this is more of an exploration. The analogy would be if I was gonna climb up a mountain, I could climb in the Scotland and Highlands, a well-known mountain where there's a path and everyone has been there before, or, I could go somewhere new and try and find a new pathway and climb it myself and be the first person. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to be the first person to discover a new pathway to a new molecule, not just take an existing pathway to an existing molecule. And that excites me a lot because it's new. And we might discover some new uh, drug or some new property or some new um, evidence of how we could go from random chemistry to complex system that you find in biology. When you find this molecule, this, this big one, or this important one, how will you name it? <laughs> uh, it chemists have a systematic way of naming them. So I, I guess it depends how interesting the molecule is. So if it's just a boring molecule, we'll use the normal chemistry. But maybe if it's, um, I don't know, totally unexpected, then we'll, we, will we will come up with a name that combines the, um, the artificial intelligence algorithm we used. So I'm not sure we'll call it how, or what's the word, or Wally, or, uh, or C3PO, but maybe 
Well, maybe we could call it C-3PO. That's a very chemical sounding uh, name. Yeah. I don't know, maybe he will name the molecule. What would you call it? C-3PO? R2-D2? J-G-1-1? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's his initials. But we, we, we call this system, uh, well, that's the finder. What are we calling this system? Multi-mode? Yeah, we haven't a name for it yet, it's so, so new. So what's the difference between those two, two machines? Um, if you call this the finder, no, uh, that's, that, the that's, finder, that's the finder. That's the finder. This is maybe the explorer. Because the, this has more... Uh, this only has like eyes and taste, where this has eyes, taste and feel, so it has more sensors to look in the chemical space. But then again, this is the explorer and that that is the finder yeah so this is going to be more explore this is going to be more exploring the pathway to, to finding lots of molecules and this is just set to finding a single new molecule maybe okay so there could be like a way you can use to describe to find lots of new routes up the mountain or just to get up to the top yeah so maybe we can go to the finder and explain just shortly to me how it works what, yep. we, what we have here is an automated cocktail maker. So basically the ingredients for the cocktail, if you like, the chemical cocktail, are up here in these, in these, in these vials. And the pipes take them into the pump. And the computer just selects which one, you know, will it use gin and tonic, gin with tonic or Bacardi or whatever, and it will check them randomly. And then when it, it mixes them in these, in these uh, round bottom flasks to start to make the cocktail. And then it will look to see if anything has happened and it will move it into the back there and we'll heat it up to make the reaction go. It's like putting it in the oven to cook it. Now, of course, we don't taste this, but the way we taste it chemically is we use this machine here. This machine is called a mass spectrometer. And what it does, it weighs the molecule. And normally when you do a reaction, the molecule either gets smaller or it gets bigger. It could, if you're unlucky, stay the same but be different. But let's assume it either gets smaller or it gets bigger. Now we look for change, and what excites us is from using small molecules to get bigger ones that are more complex. And um, we use not just the mass spectrometer, but we use this thing up here. This is a basically like a, a, a web camera, but it does it in the, the ultraviolet. And it looks for changes in the ultraviolet um, in the reactor, and it also looks for the change in pH. And what we have here is some automation to, to additionally change the sampling so we can taste it, so we can make the right taste. So what happens is the computer will select the ingredients, it gets cooked, it gets taste, tasted, and then the computer says, ah, oh, that tastes good, or it tastes new. So it asks for two questions, is it good or is it new? So we either want one, or ideally we want good and new, or, or good or new and then it then tells it the computer memory that's a good one so okay let's now take another random one and see if it's new or good and what we do is we rank them does this taste better does this taste worse is this more new is this less new is this the same as before and this is how the finder finds new molecules so is this the first uh situation in which you uh, actually really can see new life or, or th this, this comp new complexity? So I think yes, so we, are, we won't find life in here per se, but we, because we're putting in a code, what we're doing in here, we will make complex molecules more complex than you can find normally, but we will understand how much code, how much we had to cheat, and by them writing down how much we had to cheat, we can then work out randomly how long it would take. And then, with one of the other experiments that we're working on in the robots, and I can show you downstairs, we can then try and do many of those experiments in droplets to the, and explore whether this will happen by chance. But at least by doing this, we will know how by chance it will be. So this gives us the odds. Is it one in 20, one in 1,000, one in 200 million? or one in uh, infinity. Did you think of it this uh, yourself? Yeah. You designed this? With, with the help from my group, with arguments, because obviously I designed something much more complicated, and the group were like, come on, 
and and they've been brilliant. I mean, they really they had to write all the software, they had to get the all their spectroscopy, all this these big pieces of equipment to be connected to the computer in real time. Yeah. And the thing even you know sends an email at night. When I've been traveling, this thing has emailed me. No human being said, "Oh, I found something," and that's really really cool. But I can you show me an email? Uh, yes. Okay, I can. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, so, this, so what it does is it emails you and just says um, a large change observe and what it does is you might be able to just about make up here but there is a photograph and then you can see the stirrer, this stirrer in here and it shows you a photograph of the, of the fume hood. This is not so informative but it, it also lets you know that um, 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 it's not catching fire or it's safe, right? Because we can have an automatic cutout. And this is really nice because basically this is like a, what we call a chemical Google. It's a search engine, but it's much smarter than Google. Google is limited by the data inside the system. So it's a bit like you going around and taking a photograph of every cake in every cake shop in the world and putting it in a index and then Googling it. This makes them, it doesn't just, it's not, doesn't just have photographs, it actually makes them, it tastes them, it puts them in a database. So this goes way beyond, so this is the first ever chemical search engine. Um, so um, if you try to find molecules here which are new, that taste new or are good, how big is the risk that you find a molecule which is uh, destructive? Um, so it, when you're doing chemistry and you're looking for new molecules, there's always a risk the molecule could be toxic or have um, some undesirable properties. Yeah. But, but the properties that the molecules have are not magic. You can understand the laws of chemistry. So what we do is we very carefully hazard code all the molecules we put in. So what we do is we make sure that all the molecules we put in, we understand their limitations and what they could be hazardous to. Are they cancerogenic? Are they carcinogenic? Are they explosive? Are they, uh, uh, do they catch fire? And what we do is we're very careful to treat them. So all the stuff that is collected here is treated as toxic, as standard. So therefore we, we, we you know, I'm being very bad, you know, I should be wearing my safety specs and everything, so, you know. But right now this is actually turned off, so I will keep. So, but we have to safety check everything. Um, this person who operates this operates a fume hood, they wear gloves, they wear uh, a lab coat, and so everything is well protected. And but that is the way to do it, is to have very good safety. Yeah, okay, I understand the safety, but, but uh, asking yourself the question, uh, is it possible to create life? Uh, d d the same question, is it possible to cre create death? Um, you could create, I mean, in here, we're, I mean, what we're not trying to create a life form per se here. What we uh, emphasize is we're trying to look for complexity for the smallest hints. And so living systems are much more fragile than they are um, um, aggressive. And the other important thing here is the molecules we're using in here do not exist in biology. So what does that mean? Well, if this makes a poison, it's likely to be a poison for itself, not for biology. Hmm. So th this is much more um, self-contained than actually, say, doing drug discovery or making viruses or new cells, because actually it's only relevant to the chemistry in here. So what we're making is so fragile, it is unlikely. However, it is unlikely that um, we'll make something that's dangerous or living and dangerous, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't entertain the possibility when we engineer the reaction controls and our safety measures. And that's what we do here. As you can see, there's a screen in here. Everything is well controlled. Um, and there are, there is, you can see there's all sorts of uh, chemical outflows at the back here. And you can see up here where we collect all the products to make sure they are disposed of correctly according to the, the, the current um, um, directives to make sure everything is completely um, um, safe. And it's unlikely also that anything dangerous will happen. But again, I emphasize, it doesn't mean we don't anticipate that there will be a problem. Yeah. But did you ask yourself, oh. No, it's okay. Did you ask yourself that question? Solving the mystery of life is almost solving the mystery of death. Uh, well, I don't know. I guess death is less mystery than life, right? Because we see death all the time. And I guess death is needed to select 
the things that will continue going, those patterns that will keep going. So I never thought about it that way. I'm much more practical than that. I mean, like I say, what we are doing here is like, this is like a, it's almost like trying to start a very fragile, um, uh, it's like to start a watch with all the parts where you don't have a watch casing. So you have to be very careful to position them and they will all fall apart very quickly and so on. So it's very unlikely unless we do Darwinian evolution on the system that anything uh, crazy will happen. But again, I don't know yet. And I, um, I I'm, am I, do I think that this will cause something deadly? No, I don't think so, but that doesn't mean we, um, and do I think that this will give rise to a life form? N no, not at this step, because it's, the, the information contained in the system is too low. But the very process for making complexity is what we're looking for here. So I think that this might inadvertently, or no, no actually, directly give us the hints we need to take it further. And what we have to ask ourselves is how we do the uh, innovation responsibly. And uh, we have a process in our research to it called responsible innovation. It's a bit like, uh, you know, before them, uh, now when Einstein published his famous equation and then become the possibility of nuclear weapons. You know, that's quite an important responsible innovation issue there because arguably he, that equivalence of energy and mass invented nuclear weapons. Well, he didn't, they were gonna be made anyway, right? Um, but it allowed everyone to have a discussion. Here, it's much more unlikely that the complexity is gonna be anywhere near it, but we can tell you. And the other thing is we can also look to see how fragile the shadow biosphere might be and how, sh how fragile any aliens might be. Uh, which uh, matter do you use for mixing? So for mixing, there is a stirrer there and we just drop in the liquids together and they get yeah. mixed by the what, stirrer. Well, what's in, inside the li liquids? What, what, the, what the, re the ingredients, whatever yeah, ingredients. What, what ingredients do you use? They're, al well, they're alcohols, aldehydes, they're different chemicals. Like they've got, they have complicated names. What are the so how many different aldehydes? Do you use an aldehyde, an yeah. amine? You have two different amines, two different aldehydes, four different azides. Four different azides, yeah. Azides are, the f what would you find azides are normally? Uh, what, what are the names? The chemical names? They're complicated, big names. Okay. Well, that, that, that's, so, so, for our viewers to understand, what are you mixing? How do you, how, how do you, can you explain that in a simple way? Um, yeah, so the, the molecules actually are like f flavors. They're actually different flavors. They would smell differently. Aldehydes yeah. have this very interesting, like cinnamon, uh, cinnamaldehyde, benzaldehyde. Um, so these molecules are organic molecules. They're small and they have a, 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 a part on them that's like a special type of Lego and they can react with each other. And so, um, yeah, they are, it's, it's very difficult and without drawing them. <laughs> aldehyde 1, aldehyde 2, aldehyde 3, aldehyde 4, and they do a condensation reaction, but yeah. But I guess, for your viewers, what would we call them? Um, yeah, to try, just try to imagine what, 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 if they see this, what, what is it that you are mixing? Well, so we're, no, we're mixing it's like, like milk and sugar. We're, and we're mixing lots of different uh, molecules together, each, each uh, vial, uh, uh, vial here has a different molecule in it dissolved in a liquid, in a solvent. In this case the solvent is methanol, it's an alcohol. So we have an alcohol with our, with, our, with our ingredient dissolved inside, and then different ingredients dissolved in the alcohol, they're mixed together as a liquid in here, and this stirrer will stir them all together so they're nicely mixed, ready to then be pumped into here so they're heated to be cooked and for the reaction to occur. Can you see a molecule? Um, you can see molecules. Um, there you go. There are some molecules there, but obviously the molecules are very small. So all you're seeing here, everything is made of molecules. That's what chemistry is about, molecules, yeah. unless they're a salt. So although you can't see the individual molecules because they're too small, they are dissolved in here. They have this kind of yellow color. So, um, and actually this UV machine measures how yellow the molecules are, or blue or green. Yeah. And it's just put in one of the dishes and it's looking at the droplets move around. And uh, look, this one's moving around over here. That one's almost decomposing, almost falling apart, but they're wobbling. Can you see they're like, there's no life in them, but they are wobbling around and getting excited and searching, vibrating. Oh, oh, oh that one just split into two, into three. 
Oh, another one. I mean, that was pretty exciting, actually. And these are really simple mixtures. No, complica no complexity, but yet the, the droplets look like they are intelligent. This one at the bottom here keeps coming backwards and forwards and touching the side and... Very jumpy they are. They are very jumpy, yeah. But this is dead. This is dead, but the process of which is e using an evolutionary algorithm uh, to go through is like a living optimization. It's very Darwinist. And saying this is dead is not quite right. It's not quite autonomous, but it's not quite dead. In fact, probably what we're going to learn is there is no such thing as de truly dead, and there's no such thing as truly alive. There's just there's just a phenomena that can keep phenomena that can copy, and the robot here can copy for it. This is, I think, is going towards the end of the experiment. You can see here, that's really nice. You can see the code on the side in the Python script where that programs this, and then the actual outcome here. So this is really digital chemistry, digital code or chemical outcome happening right in front of you. Okay, now it's probably going to set up another experiment now. Or is it going to take the outcome out? It's now washing it out, I think. So it's now the end of the experiment. Why is the end? Well, because we do Why it for one minute. The, life, the lifetime, we do it for one minute. Um, what we might do in the future for those systems that look really interesting is we'll prolong their life. We'll keep going. And one of the things that we're doing is we're making a droplet feeder that we can make interesting droplets and continue to feed them and see how long they live for before they explode or they cease to be interesting. So, so why does that one stop right now? Do you know? Because it, it looks oh like... Oh, no, no, it it's finished now. That's just the last... That's just the last... Um, you can last image? Yeah, it's the last image. So oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So now we see a new. C can you make it bigger? Just the the the, the image. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> not easily. Because it's the native resolution of the webcam. What I might be able to do is make it. If I move it over here might be easier for you to see it. No, that doesn't matter, but I thought maybe when it's bigger. So, oh, now I can see the soap. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's going through a wash cycle. It's like a, it does, because we have to keep the thing running all the time, at the end of every experiment, it washes out, removes the old uh, discarded uh, uh, material. Automatically. Automatically, and everything is all. So there's no one here. There's no student in this room. It's all. Let's go around and have a look at the other one. We'll try not to run. We'll try and see if this other one is now working. <coughs> yeah, so this one here is just washing out. You can see it. So this is just washing out. Uh, this dish and you can see that all these pumps are moving all these different colors the reds and the blues yeah okay so it's preparing for the next experiment and this is a similar um, system at the moment 